I wanted to, so today's session is about Hasidism and our guest speaker, who's a member of the Hasidic community was going to come and speak to us, but unfortunately she canceled this morning. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just have a shorter, a little bit more basic in some ways uh, talk, and it's a bit, little bit of a different angle. So I wanted to start by asking um, who knows what about Hasidism? So if you could put your hand up. Go ahead, Lori. I only know about it from books and from a friend of mine who is Orthodox, but I don't know much at anything about it really. So Okay. Jane. I don't know a lot. What I do know is that they are a form of orthodoxy but they are a form of orthodoxy that emphasizes more emotional forms of of they worship might. and practice they tend to be more demonstrative in some ways um more and more mystical maybe would be words mystical. i would use um uh, but they're kind of kind of interesting they to me they remind me a tiny bit this is a weird parallel but they remind me a little bit of a of a Jewish equivalent in some ways to almost the Pentecostals in the mm. Christian world of being more expressive, but um, also in some ways being more conservative in some of their practice. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Paula? I can't hear you at the moment. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> all right um it reminds me just in some ways of the amish they sort of stopped time around the mid mid 1800s but they're they're not anything like the amish and then the amish are very stoic very uh, uh not emotional. Not, non emotional and i think that mm -hmm. they are very emotional and it's a completely different uh, way of Something time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. So that moves us on to this question. What stereotypes do we think of when we hear the word Hasidism? Um, so can, can we go in a breakout rooms of two people each for five minutes? Sure, let me see if I can get that set up. Give me just one sec. Okay, great. Um, In the meantime, Aaron said, I've heard of Kavana intention before, but that's the extent of his exposure. And Heather said, they follow the Torah pretty strictly. What's the Kavana? Uh, we'll, we'll come to that. Okay, actually. great. Yeah. So how many rooms do we set up? Uh, rooms of two people each. Okay, how many? I'm, I guess I'd, uh, one, two, three. Seven. Seven, okay, so I'll do uh, three then.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, is everyone back? No. Uh, everyone back now? Yes. Okay. So what what were some of the group's uh, ideas then? What are the stereotypes we think of? That they're conservative politically, that there's the stereotype that it's hard if you have an identity like gay or transgender or a woman that just doesn't want to be conformed to her roles, that it's hard for them. Mm. Okay. Fair enough, yeah. And who were you, whose group were you in? With Zian? Um, I, I yeah. was with, with Laurie, yes. And then we also commented on a little bit more like physical stereotypes, like like the curly hair and the big hats. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. D do you know the difference between the hats? Uh, no. No. <laughs> exactly. uh, and what about um, Heather? Who were you with, Heather? Uh, I was with Betty Ann and Paula, and we okay. also kind of did the physical stereotypes, like women, you know, having the, you know, their hair, you know, covered and the dresses and, and the families have so many kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough again. Yeah. And, we... uh, go on. Go, go on, Paula. 
Well, I, I, I was just going to say that we, I was impressed by some of the other groups. We didn't even get into the political aspects, which were fascinating. But, and I feel that I know those stereotypes, but interesting yeah. ones, they're just stereotypes, or they're true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, James, was it you and Janet? No, Janet came in later, and I wasn't in a group. But I was just going to mention um, one stereotype I've heard is the stereotype of education, of of implying that often uh, Hasidic people are not well educated. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's the stereotype I've heard. Mm. Right, yeah. Um, Aaron, do you want to share what you said? Well, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm kind of rambling, but uh, <laughs> maybe you can just a little, little bit more. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Uh, you said, um, you mentioned Yiddish. To begin with, that Hasidic people speak use Yiddish, right? Um, true, true. Yeah, and you also mentioned media stereotypes as well. Um, so also uh, that they outreach, they do outreach in the Jewish community. People forget that Chabad. That's an interesting one. Uh, that they give out uh, Hanukkiahs, uh, Hanukkah menorahs. They do that here too. Um, they do that where Aaron lives. Um, and there was something else. Uh, oh, uh, we mentioned the Miss Nagdim, but I can't remember if that, what relation that was to. Just that I know that, that there is definitely uh, c contentious, uh, <laughs> contentious disagreement yeah. in the Orthodox community about where um, the line should be drawn between what is or is not Hasidic and I don't, but I don't really know what that is because I'm, I've never been, and I know I didn't learn it, nor was I raised with it, so I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, James, you got your hand up again. Yeah, I was going to ask if maybe you might also touch on the difference difference between kabod and Hasidic. Was kabod a a subset of Hasidic, or is it like kabad what, is what exactly Hasidic. is kabod? Kabod is a Hasidic dynasty. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Janet, uh, you joined, you joined a little bit late, um, so you didn't get a chance to discuss it. But do you want to say uh, if you if any stereotypes spring to mind when you think of the word Hasidic? Um, oh, I'm sorry. You said stereotypes about what? Uh, uh, any stereotypes spring to mind when you hear the word Hasidism? Hasidism. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, certainly, um, I guess how they dress, you know, I guess people could stereotype them based on the how, uh, how they dress and the men wear hats and the women usually wear wigs. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, uh, I guess that would be something. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, Zania, you have your hand up? Yes, thank you. Uh, so my, my question I'm trying to understand here, is there an actual difference in the classification between Orthodox and what we call ultra-Orthodox? And is it a thing like, are all ultra-Orthodox uh, ultra uh, Hasidim or, you know, or, or, or not? <laughs> kind okay, of, so I think... A distinction there. Yeah, so I think, I think that the stereotype there is Hasidim are ultra-Orthodox. Okay, but is yeah. ultra-Orthodox a thing? Or is it just a... So, a so, we will, so we will get to that. Okay. <laughs> but I'm glad you brought it up because um, and the Chabad question from James because uh, that is important because in a way ultra-Orthodox is also a stereotype. Um, so uh, I can't share screen. <laughs> Let me fix that. Just to say, I had okay. <laughs> I had to take over hosting to to do breakout wow. rooms, but I'll switch it back to you now. Oh, thank you. Uh, if I can remember how to do that, uh, here we go. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna look a little bit. Uh, let me change my one of my stuff. 
Okay. <clears throat> so, can somebody read uh, the first paragraph, bullet point? I can read it. Hasidism, is that how you pronounce it? Is highly Hasidism. Hasidism is highly plural, pluralistic. There are at least a dozen sects. Each Hasidic master has founded his own dynasty, each with its own beliefs and practices. Thank you. Uh, it was uh, founded by Yisrael ben Eliezer, or the Baal Shem Tov, otherwise known as the Besh, who lived between 1698 to 1760. He was born in Okopi in the then Kingdom of Poland. Somebody else like to read the next one? I could do it. Uh, panentheism, divine intersects with the universe and extends beyond it. Thank you. So okay. a bit like Spinoza, Baruch Spinoza, he kind of had something similar to this, I believe something similar to this. Um, can we, we could just go around the room and read the paragraph? I'll read it. The creative principle of, oh. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. It's so infinite light. The creator contact itself. Simism. Simism, yeah. So, so Hasidism has this belief that the creative principle of Or Ein Sof, which is infinite light, otherwise known as the creator, contracted itself. And that process is called Simsum. So that's how creation happens. Dualism exists between the true aspect of everything and the physical side with each evolving into the other. Yeah. So I just want to stop for a second and say, does this sound so far like Judaism as we know it? Do we think of Judaism and we think of the infinite light as a, as a creative principle which contracts itself and that there is the divine is in everything and that there is a dualism between the true aspects of things and the physical side and they both evolve into each other. What does that sound like? It doesn't sound, it sounds, does sound mystical and it doesn't sound like it's that different from, I'm kind of a pantheist, not a panentheist, but a pantheist. And it doesn't, it sounds like there's some commonality which is surprises me because they're so different from me and what they, how they practice and what they do, but yet it kind of build what you said kind of builds a bridge in a way. Mm -hmm. Sounds Kabbalistic to me. It is Kabbalistic. Yes, indeed. Has, Hasidism is a form, a, a, a way of practicing Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't currently read the chat. Would somebody read what's in there? So I, I was just I was just commenting that uh, I'm on the same boat as Laurie. Like I uh, sometimes I, I read Chabad and I think like why does this res uh, resonate with me a little bit more than the uh, personal God idea? You know, even though I don't buy their their philosophy like wholesale. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the laws of Torah are a simple guidebook to steer us in the direction of the divine, as we can't understand Ein Sof in its absolute form. That was uh, written by the Magid, who died in 1772. Devakut, or Devakut, union with the divine needs to be pursued ceaselessly in all times, places, and occasions. Yeah. Yehudim, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, Aaron, Yehudim. Yehudim, am I saying that right? Yehudim. Yeah. Unifications, three in which the Hasid, righteous one, rises to a higher olam, plane. Mm -hmm. Again, that doesn't sound like typical, what we think of as Orthodox Judaism, does it? Mm. So contemplative awareness of the oneness of everything in creation, awareness of the realm of imaginal forces and powers, and Elohut godliness, where one integrates the highest levels of divine manifestation. Those are the ways that a 
passive should practice their vivekus, the union with the divine. Any comments so far? There again, there are some parts of this that I could resonate with as far as what they believe, but not not you know not what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what resonates with you? Just the oneness and the divine permeating everything. Mm -hmm. Um, just the holiness, the fact that everything is has holy and holiness. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's something in the chat again. Uh, well, I, I was I was raising my hand. Uh, um, what I understand, if am I understanding this correctly? To me, it sounds a little bit. Uh, platonic you know like we're in a cave and everything is shadows and you have to come out of the cave and, and see reality for what it is you know I think it's kind of going down that that uh lane or I might be mistaken yeah yeah so the founder the Baal Shem Tov, um started talking he didn't write his beliefs he started talking uh after working in solitude in the mountains in the Carpathian mountains they had this kind of, uh, according to his uh, the account of other people that say what he said, uh, he had a mystical experience in the mountain, which again is not how we typically think about about Judaism and where we get our uh, source of practice from. <clears throat> so uh, one of the uh, one of the many Hasidic practices is hit bodedut self-isolation for contemplation. So self-isolation and personal prayer or meditation involves speaking to God in one's own words and seeking spiritual clarity and personal connection. So is anybody here familiar with Hit Bodedut? Just a little bit. Um, I was encouraged once by a, a Jewish spiritual director to try it. And I, I found it interesting. It was also, um, I don't, it's, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a good, it's an, it's a different kind of practice. Obviously, when you're engaging in it humanistically, it's a whole different thing. So I was more seeking to engage with the idea of speaking to an idea of like not saying that there's literally a God I'm talking to, but rather that this idea of speaking to these aspirations, my highest aspirations, maybe. But by the time that I engaged in this, I was I was no longer believing in God as a literal out there kind of thing. So I I tried to engage with it more from the standpoint of the sense of aspirations rather than a, a being. Oh, yeah. I thought I'd read the chat and also I had a comment. Uh, the chat is um, uh, from Janet. Their thinking is similar to Buddhism in some ways with God being everywhere and with reincarnation. Um, wait a second. <laughs> my thought went out of my head. Uh, I'll have to come back to that. I can't think. Is there another comment? Because I can see. Oh, oh yes. I, I remember now that I was following this really well with the with the eyes off and all of that. And then they say speaking to God. Mm. And then that gets confusing to me because now that sounds like they're speaking to a person or to something that could talk back to them or something like that. Although they're seeking spiritual clarity and personal connection. Maybe they're just thinking a feeling will come to them or something. I don't know. But I thought that was a little confusing. Yes. So, so the Ein Sof or Ein Sof is the infinite light, which is the highest um, aspect of divinity with Malchut being the lowest. So Malchut is the material world. And that We are part of Malchut. So we are part of a manifestation of or Ein Sof or a divine manifestation or emanation to use the correct terminology um so i think that in the next slide or two uh that comment will be addressed uh if you can remind me um if it doesn't get addressed um so yeah so there is an aspect of divinity ac according to the tree of life which is sort of knowledge and intellect, uh, universal intellect in a way. 
So there is a possibility within that system of the divine speaking back to you. But Hasidim believe that the divinity does so in a very interesting way. Yeah. <laughs> so so another another practice is nigunim, which are wordless melodies used in prayer and communal gatherings to elevate the soul and foster a sense of spiritual unity and emotional connection. They are designed to bypass intellectual barriers and speak directly to the heart. Does anyone come across a nigun? We do actually do nigunim in a small in a short form at Spinoza. Can anyone think of a nigun? Well, it's just a wordless thing to say over and over. I, I I've been listening to some lectures that somebody in Seattle is doing, and they start with the nigun before it starts. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, la 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 or yeah 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 whatever. I'm, I yeah, may yeah. Have, I'm not sure, but <laughs> exactly yeah. So, who is familiar with the classical, um, the classic uh, Havdala melody? Yeah, la 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 yeah, la 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 la. Yeah, that's that's a nigun. Debbie Friedman. Debbie that, Friedman. Yeah, and she, you know, you know, I never would have connected her with something that was, you know, traditional. You know, but like that traditional. Wow. Well, oh, Hasidic. Yeah. Hmm, Hasidic. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Good. Really good. <laughs> yeah, and there's another one. Um, yeah, la 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 la. Goes on like that. That's another part of the tradition. Well, I don't know what to call it. The theistic service, Shabbat service. Yeah, just before the Baruch Yeah. So that's another nigun, and there are other ones that we are very familiar with because progressive Judaism has been influenced by neo Hasidism, so a sort of reform Hasidism. <clears throat> so it's not like everything within Hasidism is oppressive and overly traditional, and there's nothing of value in it, you know, it's quite the opposite. Um, can somebody read? Can we go around the room again and read the sentence at a time? When praying, one must pay attention to one's breath and pr pray very slowly while visualizing a flow of spiritual empowerment. Kavanah. Yeah. So uh, the Baal Shem Tov used to take so long to perform the prayers that one would one prayer time would go into the next one because it was taking so long. And some of his followers, he had a minion, um, which is a 10 people, 10 men uh, in his in his time, it was 10 men. Um, they used to walk out because of exhaustion. So he was praying for so long with so much kavana, which is really intention or presence mindfulness that his followers would walk out of the prayers they couldn't take it yeah can someone read the next sentence integrate devakut on an everyday basis while performing normal activities everyday speech contains within it all of the letters that constitute the substratum of torah right so devakut which is union with the divine uh and if you bear in mind that the divine is in this in hasidism is within everything um so tveikut means including everyday speech so uh, everything that we hear and everything that we say contains within it torah so that's one way that we can still 
be answered by the device through conversation. And years ago, when I was about eight, I, yeah, I was 18, I went to some kind of neo Hasidic meditation slash mysticism weekend. And they had us walk around. Um, and it was in a city, by the way. So we would walk around the city for 15 minutes in silence, paying attention to everything that everybody around us said. And we would then come back, sit down in a circle and tell everyone what Dvar Torah we heard, what words of Torah we'd heard. And it was really interesting because you notice things that you don't normally notice. Um, so that that was just a really interesting practice, which I I believe it can still be a humanistic, uh, spiritually humanistic practice as well. <clears throat> so the next one is even when distracted, one can still achieve the vacant, um, as all thoughts and moments have divine origin. So what they mean by that is one form of mindfulness is listening to your distract your distractions, listening to the thoughts you have which distract you from prayer, because those thoughts are also divine. So they trace the origin of each thought to the divine. Oh, so I also think which I also think is very interesting. Yeah. Hmm. What was that? Paula, did did you comment on that? No, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I'm um, that I was talking. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, and then the other the other sentence says every pious person, the chassid means pious person or righteous person, can achieve to vacate. So that's all very interesting, I think. Okay, uh, can somebody else read the? Can we do what we what we're doing? Go around the room and read this. These beliefs and practices ran contrary to what was originally considered traditional Judaism, orthodoxy is a post-enlightenment concept, which was centered on study of the Torah. Indeed. So somebody earlier said, I I think it was Zyanya, um, and also Aaron mentioned it in our in our breakout. Um this this concept ultra orthodox. So Aaron, I don't know if you're still here, Aaron. But uh, are you here? I can't see who's here. Can somebody tell me? I don't, I don't see. I don't see him here. Oh, we must have lost him. Okay. Aaron mentioned that one part of his family was from Lithuania, um, where they believe there was that there were the mis, mis, misnagdim. So the misnagdim were people that opposed Hasidism. So the term ultra orthodox is actually misleading. Uh, and it's a little bit incorrect in this context because Hasidism is just as non-traditional as Reform Judaism was when it began. So Elijah Zalman, who's also known as the Vilna Gaon, who died in 1797, wrote a series of polemics against the innovation of Hasidism, which he said transgresses the Torah and changes its laws. They even go so far as to claim that their way is precious to God, and that the word itself, Hasidism, or Hasidim, is an abomination. And they are, they are called the Misnagdim. So orthodoxy, originally, was about concentrating as, on study of the Torah, doing the prayers, and following halakha collect, correct, correctly. It had nothing to do with Tveikut, with Hitvodidut, with Nigunim, any of these things that we just mentioned. They, the these people who we would now consider to be Haredim, so these are ultra orthodox people. They oppose and they still oppose Hasidism. Is that clear? So when I say ultra orthodox is a bit of a stereotype, does this tell us why? Where would we find the ultra orthodox? So we know where to find the Hasidim, but where would we find the ultra orthodox? So yeah, so ultra orthodox is a bit of 
it's a bit misleading because there's the Misnagdim and the Hasidim. They both follow to the letter halakha, Jewish law, but they it's the way they follow it. Uh, the Misnagdim do not believe in Kabbalah. So when we think of the Haredi community, we're normally thinking of the Misnagdim. How do you spell that word? M-I-S-N-A-G. D I M. Okay, yeah. so l let me see if I got this straight. Uh, please let me know if I'm mixing up things. Okay, so there's the Orthodox, and a synonym for Orthodox would be Haredi. No. Or <laughs> or Haredi are what we call ultra Orthodox, which is a misnomer for everyone. Okay, and then Hasidic just means another thing entirely. They're not Orthodox, they're not ultra-Orthodox, they're their own thing, they're Kabbalists, right? They're Kabbalists, okay. um, but they, in today's terms, they may say that they are Orthodox, but I have been to conferences where there are members of the Hasidic community uh, present who's, who have said that they take objection to the term ultra-Orthodox. Because for a startup, ultra orthodox does not only describe them, it describes the misnagdim. So, what we we would say Haredi, we would refer to somebody as Haredi, to the that's somebody who is ultra orthodox. But when we see Hasidim, we would tend to call them Hasidim. We like we wouldn't call them Haredim. Okay. So, but but, but, the both... but the Hasidim would be okay with being called just Orthodox. Some would, some wouldn't. Or yeah, so they wouldn't really because they would say there's no such thing because Orthodox is an innovation. Oh, okay. No, Orthodox uh, isn't a thing. They'd say there's Judaism. There's just Judaism. And within that, there is being a chassid, which being a chassid is not a sect to them, just a dynasty within, they would describe people in different dynasties as authentically Jewish or not. So there is somebody who is not a chassid is not authentically Jewish. What is Haredi? Haredi is a mis, uh, Haredi mother mis, misnagdim. Okay. Okay. Got it. So they are ultra orthodox, but again, they wouldn't say that. They would say we're just Jewish. Mm. The ultra orthodox is a very strange concept, really. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's important to shy away a little bit from using these terms or to challenge these terms because we also think of Judaism as a hierarchy. Mm. And so we say, like, ultra orthodox is on one end of the spectrum, and, and then there is like, ultra liberal on the other end of the spectrum which we would be part of but i have friends that think of me as religious and yeah and i'm a humanist so you know i'm i i'm more religious than somebody that might consider themselves orthodox but i'm not orthodox you know and i think that we have to challenge the hierarchy as if somehow one is more authentically jewish than the other it's all, they're all just sects of Judaism or ways of expressing Judaism. Um, I can see a, a message in the chat that I can't read. Oh, I was just asking because I thought I remember hearing that the old Orthodox or the Haredi actually have a really big demographic in Israel. And they have, I think, I've heard they have a lot of more um, influence. When it, not even just in the religious, but in like I just saw an article about how some how about there might be you know getting them to join the military might cause some uh, discord, so to speak. Yes, um, yes. So Haredim, yeah, Haredim and Hasidim have a lot in common, apart from the fact that one that Haredim do not recognize Hasidim. So, but many Haredim 
are also anti-Zionist. So many Hasidic communities are also anti-Zionist, but not all of them. And not all, uh, so within Hasidism, there's Satma dynasty and there's Chabad as well, which is Hasidic. And people don't tend to think of Chabad and Satma as being related, but they are two dynasties who are equally considered to be Hasidic dynasties. Um, but Chabad is Zionist and um, Satmar is not. And there are many Haredi sects that are also not Zionist. But within Satmar dynasty, there's Netare Karta, which are the ones we see with the Palestine flags, um, you know, protesting against Israel. Um, they are not even recognized by Satmar. So they've been... Um, what's the word, um, excommunicated from Judaism by Satmar itself. They believe they go too far. So there you go. Um, but yes, they don't join the military because of uh, their anti-Zionism. So, humanistic pacifism. Is, is there or can there be such a thing? So, uh, I want to go in uh, breakout rooms again and discuss this question. How might the following elements of Hasidism be incorporated into a humanistic, into a Hasidic humanistic Jewish framework? Into a humanistic Jewish framework. Hit bodedut, negunim, and being a Hasid. What was the meaning of that first word? Hit for the Dutch was the going into, so I will check again and uh, show us again, Annie. Here you go. Hit for the Dutch, self isolation and personal, personal prayer or meditation involving speaking to the divine or God right. in one's own words. Okay. Yeah. And could you, put, world could you put the question in the chat so we can bring it into the room with us? Indeed, I will, yeah. Um, can someone can someone put that? <sighs> or show it on just so it share the screen for a second.
Looks like we're all back. Are we all back? Looks so. like. Okay, who would like to share first? Laurie, go ahead. Well, we were talking um talking about um um mostly the retreating, self isolating for purposes of spirituality. We got got off onto like how different religions do that like buddhism and quakers how they have silent we went into not so much isolating as into silence using silent meditation as a way of connecting getting past the words and getting past the words seem to be a way that was similar to hasidim hasidism mm -hmm. in connecting to god yeah you were with janet i think yeah yeah Okay. Did you make any distinction with Nigun? We didn't really get into that. We got so much into talking about um, meditation and how um, I had not really meditated, but I was thinking of trying some form of meditation. Mm. And it was interesting. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Who, who else would like to say? Well, we we talked about how we liked the idea of jumping past Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox to Hasidism, to connecting <laughs> because of the idea of not how they live their lives and everything, but the idea of trying to connect to the ground spirit or what we call it a different thing. But um, uh, so we kind of looked at it that way, that we we liked the idea of of uh, the intention. And and that we think the spirituality that we're doing here, humanism, is is about intention of trying to intend to to live a spiritual life, uh, you know, to whatever that means to us, to to um, in our interactions with other people, and um, just you know, like the idea of nagunam and stuff like that. And I'm not saying this very well, but I think you get the picture. I, I get it. I think what you're saying is that you're trying to be a Hasid in your everyday life. I'm yeah, to, yeah. The Kabbal, yeah. Kabbalic principles that I understood when I studied Kabbalah, not the yeah. the conformity. We we yeah. we we contrasted with the conformity, like humanists are not conformists, and the Hasids are conformists. You know, they're very conformant. To their, they have all kinds of outward conformity, even though inwardly you're trying to connect. We we connected with the inward connection, and not the external conformity. Yeah, yeah. Um, which which group were you in, by the way? Who are you with? Oh, with we were with Heather again. With Heather. Okay, cool. As uh, Zanya and Jane. Is that yeah, we talked, and Zianya, feel free to jump in too. We can tag team this a little bit, but uh, we talked a little bit about how that we both were feel drawn to some aspects of the Hasidic tradition. I, I think for me especially, I would say the neo-Hasidic tradition, especially uh, the ideas and way of being that Reb Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi embodied. I, I'm a big fan of him for a lot of reasons. He really kind of exposed me to some really important ways of engaging with Judaism. Um, he also famously, and, and again, this is controversial. We're all not going to agree on this. I'm pretty certain. But um, he advocated for experimenting with psychedelics as a part of Judaism. And that was uh, because of this direct experiential kind of thing. And so he saw it as one more path, mystical path. Um, and so I find that super interesting. On the other hand, what Zianya and I both talked about also was 
not being so okay with the controlling aspects of it. And Zianya, do you want to jump in here and tell a little bit about um, what you're asking at the end? Sure, thanks. So uh, so I was uh, telling James that the conservative community I used to go to is in this uh, famous expat community in San Miguel de Allende, like an hour away from me. And recently, uh, Chabad sat there in that same city. And, and I'm kind of curious to just go and see what, what it's about, because I like their website. I, I don't know if that's, you know, enough. I'm not going to convert or anything, but I like some of their ideas. But as I was telling James, I suddenly uh, realized like, oh, wait, I'm a woman. <laughs> Am I going to even be allowed to enter? But it, it gave me the impression, like their local web page gave me the impression that uh, the rabbi's wife was also very hands-on. So maybe there's kind of a women's program or something. And basically, I just uh, concluded that one of these days, I might go just for the sake of experimentation and reporting back to you guys whatever happened, even though the rate of rejection or heartbreak or something might be high. But if I go with that mindset, you know, it might be a fun experience like, oh, this worked or oh, it didn't work. I don't know. So that's that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, they do, they are open to men and women. Uh, unfortunately, only men and women. But, um, and heterosexual men and women. Um, so, uh, but yeah, um, Chabad, yeah, they have, they have programs for, for both, yeah. Um, did, you, did you think a little bit about Itbaredut or Nigunim? Yes, uh, I, I mentioned first that maybe we could adapt those concepts to our humanistic values. And then James mentioned a renewal. So in some way, maybe this is a, a, a oversimplification, but you know, maybe uh, the work is done for us a bit in, in a renewal and neo-hazardism, and maybe we can work it from there instead of trying to, you know, uh, reinvent the wheel. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I have a question. Oh, yeah, the three yeah. things were Herodot, Hidurot, uh, Hasnigan. What was the last one? Being a Hasid. No, the three things, the last one was Hasid? Yes. Oh, okay. Then I don't need to write that. Yeah. Because being a Hasid is a spiritual practice. I see. Hasidic doesn't mean ultra orthodox. It means oh. piety. Like mm -hmm. Hasidut means piety. Mm. Yeah. So of course within that, you know, we can be try to be better people, develop our values, live in like harmony between our ethics and our values, repairing the world, all of these kinds of things, like our speech, trying to speak uh, more ethically, do more ethical things, think more ethically. This is this is what Hasidut means. Um, so, like all things humanistic Jewish, we we can practice it. We can we can make it ours, you know. And I I very much believe in taking away the authority from people who say they have authority. <laughs> you know, and if, if they say you can't do Hasidut, then I will try to do Hasidut. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> uh things like that. Um so some uh, I need to share my screen again. You should be able to now. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, could somebody read that for me? Out loud. Okay, hit both. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go for it. 
<laughs> Thank you. Hit the dot. Personal reflection and introspection, solitary walks in nature, journaling or quiet contemplation, focusing on personal growth, self-awareness and emotional clarity. Instead of seeking connection with the divine, the focus is on connecting with one's inner self, understanding one's emotions and setting personal goals. Yeah. So that could be hit for the dot in a humanistic framework. Does that sound similar or way off from what we were saying in our groups? Yeah. Can somebody read the next one? Nigunim. Wordless melodies can enhance emotional connection, mindfulness, and personal reflection. Deepen our connection with others. Singing or listening to a nigun can serve as a meditative tool promoting emotional clarity and introspection. Is anything, apart from the grammar mistake, is anything jumping out there? It sounds like it gets past the words. Um, yep. Makes me want to experiment with them more, frankly, in our services uh, as a, as a, as a, as a thing. I, the only thing I think is challenging when I think of Nagunam that I really like, they're ones that are, you know, you have multiple people singing together and kind of the energy that comes from that. That's a little bit harder to do in Zoom where we can't really talk, be heard at the same time. It's the only negative I hear, but yeah. I'm going to play with, I think I'm, I'm hearing the challenge. We need to play with more Nagunam in our services. I think it'd be a good thing. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> yeah. And the next one. Hasid, ethical, ethical living, personal integrity, and communal responsibility, rather than solely spiritual devotion. Being a Hasid can mean striving to embody the highest ethical standards in all aspects of life, demonstrating compassion, kindness, and justice in interactions with others and contributing to the well-being of the community. Personal reflection and continuous self-improvement are also key as we seek to align our actions with our values and cultivate inner qualities such as empathy, patience, and resilience. Does anything jump out on any of these? I love that. I think that's what I try to do, <laughs> you know? Yeah, Yeah, I, I agree. I think that worded in, in this way or seen in this way, it, it aligns what we do as, as humanistic Jews. I mean, uh, there's not one thing of these that I see as impossible. I, I think they're all um, pretty doable as humanistic Jews or, and, and worth embarking upon. Okay. So we're just going to watch a famous or well-known um, Hasidic uh, singer sing a Rebbe. It's called uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a it's a Rebbe music. Can you hear this? We're not hearing it, so you'll have to go back out of the Zoom, you know, the sh the share screen, and be sure and hit the the I, share I was, audio thing. I was hearing it. I, I was I hearing it too. I was hearing oh, it okay. too. Oh, never mind. Then yeah. that's the problem on my end. Uh huh. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
That was a short nigun. That was short. <laughs> <laughs> that was short. Yeah. Yeah. That so was, was beautiful. That was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I do think that it's a nice practice, and I I would like it if we if we incorporate things like that, um, and even the fact that it was nearly five minutes long um even that's a good thing because i think that okay we're watching it in a in a class setting but uh in a classroom setting but if that was a spiritual practice five minutes is not very long you know and if you were closing your eyes and taking deep breaths and focusing on just listening to the wordless melody i think it can help express a lot of feelings and emotions and there are nigunim for different uh, in different settings for different times of day and all of that. I think nigunim is a very interesting spiritual practice. My suggestion would be like if you're putting it in a service, just tell people how long it's going to be. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think it's a baby steps thing. I mean, I think if we were, I think there, in our services, I could see it being either by way of recording for sure but also i could see it being our own of singing melodies that are meaningful to us um and of, of different lengths um you know i think there'd be a lot of possibilities so yeah it kind of gets you it kind of gets you to the point where you're focusing on it yeah um has anyone seen 
astral gene. It's a series about the modern Orthodox people in Israel. What's it called? What's it called? Surugim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of it. Okay. Um, I didn't have time to find... But there is um, an episode in that where uh, one of the characters stumbles on some people in in a park singing Nigunim. And he sits down, he loves it, he closes his eyes, he sings along. And then afterwards they say, teach us your nigun. And he says, well, I don't have a nigun. And they say, everyone has a nigun, teach us your nigun. <laughs> that's interesting, he, the, idea, the yeah. idea that everyone has a nigun. That's really an interesting thing to think about. I um, have a mental soundtrack. Some people do, some people don't. But my mental soundtrack is things like pop songs. You know, I think I would benefit from including some better songs, you know, or better tunes. Yeah. So it could it could be uh, an interesting thing to do at home if people feel feel like it. Is to to think, what would your nigga yeah. be? Yeah. Well, I could listen to some of my mental soundtrack and see if there are any spiritual things that pop up, you know. Yeah. It's got to come from you. Yeah. Not from somewhere else. Not from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> <laughs> my show music is what comes to my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But you could adapt you could adapt a nigun to something. If you wanted, I suppose, like who's to say, I mean, Nigun, your own Nigun is supposed to come from from you directly. But, yeah. yeah, no, I like that. Yeah. yeah, I think mine might come from nature, like listening to birds and what kind of song would birds, what would you know, something, something in the natural world. Yeah. So they normally have the words. Yai lalai or yoi lalai or lalaloi loi or nananana or nai nanai, things like this. Yeah. So I don't know what a bird, I mean, of course, yeah, I, I like that idea, but I don't know. It's interesting. You could try and figure out if a bird was singing a nigun, what what letters, what <laughs> syllables? Yeah, what with? would what what would a bird sing with those, either of those things you mentioned? Which of those would the birds sing and what would it, their mood be? Yeah. <laughs> well, those are just yeah. the syllables. You still have to come up with the tune. Yeah. You know, and the bird can provide more of the tune. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. It's in, an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. I would love to, I would love to know, I would love to hear or find out what, how people got on trying to do this. Um, I don't know the best way for us to share it with each other. Maybe just people, everyone sing theirs. I know it's hard to do together, but mm -hmm. everyone could just do theirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is interesting. Okay. I, I, I'm a very amateur musician and I play harmonica and lately I've been playing around with an instrument called a tin whistle which is used in a lot of traditional Irish music, but I heard it recently at an American Folk Festival. And what I like about those instruments are is that as long as you're in the right key, you can basically play any melody that's in a major key. And so what's interesting is also very fun for improv, is that improv improvising and just making up melodies. And so uh, I, don't know, I may play with that a little bit and then then turn it into syllables, you know, but it might be kind of fun. And it, it is kind of fun to see where melodies take you and stuff. So I don't know, it'd be kind of cool. Do you think yeah. in the beginning or in a ma major key is there than a minor key? I think they're yeah. minor key. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, I think a lot of Nagunams really are more minor key. A lot of them, uh, <laughs> those instruments in particular, they, they tend to be more for major key and key songs. Yeah. Yeah. But you can play them, just it's a little trickier to get in the accidentals to give you the minor key, but you could do it. But I do think a lot of the more traditional nagun nagunams are done in. Uh, Ashkenazi, in, 
Ashkenazi um not music um the liturgical tradition the Ashkenazi liturgical tradition is uh, normally in the minor key Sephardi is major oh really oh yeah okay. yeah so either one's kosher <laughs> yeah well <laughs> I think Nikudim is not a Sephardi practice but uh -huh. it's an Ashkenazi practice right it's a Hasidic practice right they're Ashkenazi yeah. Could nigunim be like like percussion based, or a a nigun? Oh, do nigunim. Yeah. Thank you. Can okay. they be so could a nigun be percussion based, or or does it have to be more melody? They are because you know percussion is like music still, right? This works. Say yes, it is percussion is music, but nigunim are nigunim are wordless words okay but if part of okay. the described as wordless melodies and so from that standpoint i think percussion would be kind of a different kind of thing but i think some of this i think the basic concept could certainly be translated in more rhythmic direction of saying what would um the process might be similar but i think the the form itself is it's a wordless melody so um yeah um, interesting question I, pro I probably could not make up a melody to save my life i just don't have that composing music chip but what about like if i just came up with a dance that i could do to an existing nigun i i mean i think people can do what they want <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know um i don't think i don't think that when you're asking can it be I just give what I think it can be and what I don't think it can be. But if you think that it can be a dance or you think that it can be percussion, yep. I don't, there's no reason why it cannot. Yep. I think that I feel yeah. like dancing to a Nagoon, trying to find them, you know, moving with the Nagoon, you know, finding one on YouTube and dancing to it. I, that feels right to me. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are Nagoonim that are, <laughs> Uh, there are two melody nigun ni melodies that people have played on instruments, so you can. I never heard of dance as a form. I think dance would be something else, like another form of dvekut. You know, like another yeah, and another another form of union with nature or with oneself or or with the divine, if you want to call it, if you're pantheist, you know. So I don't see why I don't see why not, but it'd be, it would be interesting to see is there a nigun that you can listen to that speaks to you directly and you can create a dance to it. Yeah, There's another not? thing that that called a, a form of expressive art where people paint to music. They listen to music and they paint. And that's another thing I sometimes play with pain, although I'm not a real artist, and I could see painting to a nigun. Yeah, and absolutely. seeing what yeah. it looks like to me. That that would be beautiful. Yeah, I mean, all of all of the suggestions are beautiful. So yeah, that sounds incredible. Yeah. Uh, okay, guys. Um, that's I suppose the end of the formal lesson. Uh, I'm sorry if it wasn't very detailed. It was written two hours before the start of the lesson. It was great. It was great. Oh, this is fabulous. This is really yeah. good. This is the concept. It's wonderful. Yeah, I needed, I I needed let, this just now. <laughs> I didn't want to let anyone down and cancel, you know, so I'm glad that it was meaningful to people. Um, I can stay on for, for a half hour, but maybe we can stop the recording now. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Are we going to find out when the 